And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living and moving thing with which the water teems, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number, and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. The author of the Genesis repeatedly mentions that God looked at his work and saw that it was good. In whichever ways the things that were created develop, God's word created it to be good. The more distant space is animated first, water and air. The animals of the land follow, and God blesses them all. He gives them the ability to procreate, fertility, and duration. Once again, God's original deeds are told in a vivid language. The entire fauna and flora on the earth are brought into being. Species that will come and disappear, new ones that will develop. Darwin's theory of selection, or his theory of evolution, does not shake the eternal God of creation, who, from the beginning, made space and time, becoming and dying, come into being. Theodoret thus expresses this joy in God's manifold creation. Regard the earth and its manifold shape. It is not at all the same height and not at all the same low level, but there are mountains, valleys, and plains. In the middle of extended areas there are hills, and in midst the mountains there are low-lying areas. And God created even the mountains in such a way that they would serve to the best of humanity. The mountains supply wood for building. The plain brings forth an abundance of corn for the mountain dwellers. The growth of the fruit intended as our food and also refreshes our eyes, for one soon tires of what is uniform. And Cyril of Jerusalem asks, Is the creation evil in itself only because you cannot penetrate the essence of all that was created? Can you know the power of all the plants? Can you know which purpose every animal serves? But maybe these things are unknown to you. Maybe you are not interested in the nature that surrounds you. In our hectic everyday life, we have forgotten to watch nature, to listen to it and to live in harmony with it, to see God's creation in it. But Haydn lets those who were there from the beginning rejoice. Now heaven shines in full splendor. Now the earth is resplendent in her jewelry. The air filled with the light plumage. The waters are swelling with the teeming of fish and the ground grows heavy from the weight of the animals. And the angels touched their immortal harps and sang the wonders of the fifth day. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. 
God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. God puts humans at the end of his creation. They differ from the other creatures which were each assigned their habitat. Humans are made in God's image, which means that at God's side there is the essence of humanity. They are able to be partners and an answering opposite for God. The sexes were created equal, as man and woman, and therefore they are equally close to God as men or women. Both do not only receive God's blessing, but also the task of taking on the responsibility for everything else that was created. God calls humans, equipped with such power and magnificence, to a freedom of thought and action. Despite all the different deformities that have often disfigured the course of man's history, the image of the Creator and the challenge connected with it shine through the ages of the history of mankind. The question of whether humans became human in the course of time is not important. Whether there has been a particular intervention from God's part in addition to the Big Bang, one from which Homo sapiens eventually evolved, humanity is now rather able to question this and to research it, something the other creatures are not able to do. Where do I come from? Where do I go? And what is the purpose of my life? Faith, religion, a connection back from the creature to the Creator can give an answer. The Creator of the universe has given us all the same nature. We are all breathing God's breath that animates us and drives us on. God's beauty is reverberating within all of us. Therefore, Gregor of Nyssa said, Among the very good that God created, there was man who was adorned with beauty in excess of everything beautiful. He, reflection and image of eternal life, was beautiful, true and very beautiful, with the shining trace of life on his face. In a moving aria, Haydn lets the angel of the throne, Uriel, hear the following in the creation. Clad in honor and majesty, equipped with beauty, strength, and courage, straight towards the sky there stands the human, a man and king of nature. The magnificent broad-domed brow announces the deep meaning of wisdom, and from the bright look the spirit shines, the breath and image of the Creator. Nestled into his bosom for him, made from him, his wife, lovely and graceful. She smiles at him in joyful innocence, an entrancing image of spring. Her look speaks of love, happiness, and bliss. And God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good and the heavenly choir celebrated the end of the sixth day with loud song.